Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming here today. My name is Kim, and I'm the current rep for the Northern Region. It's my pleasure today to welcome you to the National Surgical Teaching Society's first regional lead webinar. And today we have Mr. Narman Pubanachandra spearheading our series with a lecture on ophthalmology. So Mr. Pubanachandra graduated with distinction from Cambridge, and he's now working as a consultant pediatric ophthalmologist at the Norfolk and Norwich Norwich University Hospital. He's also the head of school in ophthalmology in the east of England and the associate professor um, and associate uh, uh, postgraduate dean. Okay, so um, Mr. Pubanachandra has been very dedicated to driving forward training in the specialty, uh, creating the first regional ophthalmology teaching program and the regional induction course, as well as helping develop exam preparation courses and simulation training for postgraduate exams. Uh, working beyond the region, he's also contributed a lot uh, to an international textbook of pediatric ophthalmology and is invited annually to teach projects internationally in Sudan, China, and Kenya. Without further ado, I want to pass the stage or the virtual stage uh, to the distinguished Mr. Narma Pubanachandra. Uh, sir. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, can you hear me okay? Good. Right. Um, thank, so good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation to come and speak to you all. Um, this is, I understand, your first of these webinars, so you have nothing to compare it to, which is brilliant, because I can just basically make it up as I go along and you can't criticise it. But what we're going to do this afternoon uh, or the evening is to go through a specialty that you might not get a lot of experience or exposure to. I was lucky enough to have lots of exposure to ophthalmology because I'm third generation eye surgeon in my family. And even though I tried to avoid it as a career because I wanted to carve my own route, I was eventually brought back to it because it is a fantastic um, career. And I will go on about how wonderful a career it is. And I make no apologies for doing so because the one thing I hope that you will have at the end of your careers is, a, is have had a career where you're passionate and enjoy the specialty that you've got. And I, I'm certainly lucky enough to have that in abundance. So hopefully I will inject some of that enthusiasm to you and you can translate that into either ophthalmology or, some, or something similar. Um, so let's go, let's go, let's, let's, let's traverse. Now we, we mustn't have a talk about ophthalmology uh, that's all positive. There are some disadvantages. The three main disadvantages are one, it's a very difficult word to spell, so you're going to have to get used to that. There's lots of spellings there, and I know this is not an interactive talk, so I can't quiz you, but there's loads there, and all of those I've seen on referral letters from various colleagues uh, around the place. Uh, none of them are correct apart from number four. It's a Greek word, ophthalmologist, to do with the eye, study of the eye. Second big problem, you often get mistaken for an optician. Uh, which is, you know, not an insult because opticians have got very important jobs, but they manufacture glasses and are good at screening for eye disease. Uh, and they're ophthalmologists, we're on the cutting edge. We do the surgery, we do the diagnoses, and we do the treatment and management. So yeah, you do get mistaken for an optician. Um, and so some people don't think you're a doctor at all, which can work to your advantage, particularly if you're on planes and they call for a doctor, you can probably pretend you're not. And the third one is at, at, at all parties, without any exception, you will be asked about laser eye surgery. So you need to have a little paragraph that you spout out each time about that or vary it. You know, you can sometimes be positive, sometimes you can be negative. As you can see, I wear glasses. I don't do laser eye surgery, um, but plenty of people do. Look at them. They're all very happy. So clearly it is something positive in the world. Um, but those are the three main disadvantages of the specialty. That's, that's about it, really. Because apart from that, there is something in this specialty for everyone. You, you would probably think it's one organ, maybe two organs, because you've got two of them, um, but that it's only a limited scope. But actually, I'm going to try to convince you that there is huge amounts to ophthalmology that give something for every single individual who's become a medical student to get their teeth into. And this is the most important one, and it's underestimated in a career. 
when I was a medical student, I didn't really think about it too much. We all went into medicine thinking we'd like to do some good and be ha and, and help people. Yeah, it's great. And then we start to get career focused and minded. But actually, when you look back um, on a daily basis at your, your job, the thing that makes you happy, the thing that makes you sleep well at night, the thing that makes you tick is how happy your patients are. And our patients are the happiest patients. Nobody knows what it's like to die but people can imagine what it's like not to be able to see. And your vision is the most, single most valued sense and function that you've got. Um, and to not have it or to lose it um, is incredibly difficult to deal with. And therefore the reverse is true. If we can restore vision, which we do on a weekly basis to lots and lots of people, our most basic bread and butter operation restores vision in abundance. And in doing so, we transform people's lives. And that is an absolute privilege. Okay, so you can't underestimate how important that is to us uh, and to any doctor really. My poor wife is a psychiatrist and she barely ever gets that once a year, so, um, any feedback from the patient that's positive. So, you know, I really do appreciate what we get. The next thing is surgery. Now, surgery is not for everyone. Ophthalmology is both a physician's and a surgical specialty. So it's got a bit of medicine, a bit of surgery in it. The surgery is very varied and there's lots of different types. Our bread and butter is the cataract operation. You can see a sort of three-dimensional image, cross-sectional image there. And I'll talk you through that in a moment. There's vitreoretinal surgeries, corneal surgery, there's squint surgery to align eyes and muscles. So there's lots of different varieties of surgery that we do, as well as plastics. I'll come to those uh, in a bit, but they are challenging. They're fun. They're not, it's not so difficult that you would say, I, I haven't got the hands for this. If you've got reasonable dexterity uh, and you can thread a needle, you can do various sewing or something sim sim similar, then I could probably teach you to be an eye surgeon. If you're completely cack handed and you drop everything um, and you are useless, um, then I would probably avoid it. Uh, but you wouldn't avoid it just because you think, oh, I don't think I'm quite dexterous enough to do it. Because as you'll see later, we can teach you that. This is the machine that we use, uh, for example, for intraocular surgery. Um, this is called the phaco emulsification machine. It's got a little ultrasound probe at the end, which allows us to break up bits of the lens and it's got suction and it's got aspiration of fluid into the eye. You can see a, a pretend surgeon sitting there in front of the, behind the patient with the microscope, looking down the microscope. So it's basically like playing a computer game and you've got your, both your hands operating with instruments, both your feet on different, one, your left foot on the microscope control, your right foot's on the FACO control, and it's like driving a car um, and doing a computer game at the same time. Uh, and the procedures are generally quite short, which is a nice novelty. I mean, I did, a, I did an operation on Monday morning on a neonate, and it took me about half an hour, whereas the poor general surgeon, general pediatric surgeon, a specialty that I had envisaged doing initially, um, took six hours to do their operation. Uh, I wouldn't have a stamina for that. The operations that we do can be very varied, but the commonest one we do probably is, as you all will realize, it's the cataract operation. This is a child that I've operated on with cataract. You can see the abnormal red reflex on, on, on this child's right eye. And, and that is a congenital cataract. That's a close up image of it. Now, adult cataracts are different in appearance. They sort of tend to be a bit sort of darker and more brown or greeny brown. And um, this is, uh, uh, I'll, I'll let this play in the background uh, briefly. This is uh, the kind of view you get looking down the microscope uh, and what we, I'll, I'll talk you through it just, it's a few minutes. Um, this is uh, the eye itself looking from above. You're seeing the pupil, you're seeing the red reflex from the retina heading back towards you. And the lens is situated behind the iris in the pupil plane. And what you're seeing there is a 2.75 millimeter keratome with a plain incision, making an incision. Now everything is magnified by the microscope. So although it's 2.75 millimeters, it feels a lot bigger when you're looking at it on a microscope. You then fill the eye with this viscoelastic material to inflate it. And that fills the eye and gives a good pressure to be able to do the procedure. Um, your next bit is to make some side ports. These side ports are less than a millimeter in size and they'll be used for second instruments to go in and manipulate tissue in a bit. And this allows basically keyhole surgery, but in a kind of um, confined microscopic way. Um, we do most of our surgery, as you say, down microscopes. Some of the surgery we'll do is with loops. So now what we'll do, I'll do is I'll just make a little incision on the capsule of the lens, lift up a little la layer. That layer is the anterior capsule. You can just see me lifting 
a kind of radius of a circle and it's about 10 or, 20, 10 or 15 micrometers thick and then you just roll that round in a circle to make a circular opening in the anterior capsule. This is incredibly fun, difficult to do when you're learning, but we can teach you and we've got simulators as I'll show you later. You then have to inject some fluid underneath that anterior capsular ring and you'll see that fluid wave going around the lens um, and that allows me to dissect the lens from the capsule. Um, and then I just want to make sure that that lens is nicely mobile within the capsule. So here we are, you can just see it rotating around a little bit. And the next bit we're going to do is you use the ultrasound. Now the ultrasound has irrigation, you'll see fluid coming out of it. It has aspiration, it'll suck things back up. And it will also have phaco emulsification. So that's the little silver probe, the, the bluish probe at the top, the tip vibrates at high frequency. And what I'll do first is just make a little groove in the actual uh, lens. So you'll see a sort of ch like a, a channel being carved um, deeper into the eye, obviously not going too deep because we don't want to come out the back of the lens in through the posterior capsule. That would be a complication and there's a posterior capsule rupture. And then what we'll do is introduce a second instrument and we'll divide up this lens into bits. We'll break up the lens into half initially. So you'll see me cracking it. And once I've cracked it in half, I can rotate it round and make little cuts like a slicing of a cake and sucking up section by section. And it, the ultrasound vibrates, breaks up the lens and it sucks it back up again. And again, you're in complete control of that. And, and you've got a machine that's trying to maintain all of the diameters and, and, and sections of the, of the um, eye for you. Um, and if done carefully, you can avoid puncture of the posterior capsule, which is the aim of the game, so that you're then basically removing it, a bit like a slicing of a cake and breaking it up into sections. And once you've done that, you'll have an empty capsular bag. Um, so you can see that's half the lens done, rotating the lens round, and you can see me sort of breaking it down. And now you can see the edge of the lens now coming into view. It's only a very short video, it shouldn't be two or three more minutes, but I just thought it'd be quite nice for you to see the kind of view of, because this is our lives, this is what we do, this is uh, surgery, you know, variations on a theme. So having removed the, 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 the nuclear lens, we're now going to suck out the cortex, so what you can see next is bimanual instruments going in through the small incisions that are less than a millimetre in size either side, and we're going to use those. One has got irrigation, um, which is uh, initially the one I'm putting in on the left, and then a few bubbles of air have gone in, and then the suction on my right with a little hole, and you can see I've sucked, sucked up the air bubbles to get them out of my view, and then I'm going to peel the cortical lens matter away from the actual capsule. I want the capsule to remain in place, but this is the cortical material of the lens that's wrapped around the inside of the capsule, hugging the inside of the anterior capsular edge and, 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 and you can see me peeling it away from the posterior capsular edge, avoiding going in and um, engaging with the posterior capsular edge. And having removed half of it, I can then flip around so it's nice to be able to be a bit ambidextrous. But again, that's a teachable skill, not a not a skill that you have to have in, in addition. That's me being a bit clumsy and introducing air bubbles again. Uh, so we'll just remove those and then we suck out the um, remaining bit of cortex. And, and this, in the old days, what they used to do is make a massive cut and deliver the whole lens out. And that was called an extra capsular cataract extraction. And before that, they used to go in and with the capsule, just freeze probe on it suck the whole lens with its capsule out and that was called an intracapsular cataract extraction but this is phaco emulsification it's been around for 30 40 years probably and and it's revolutionized what we do so now what you've got is an empty capsule with a small uh, circular ring um, of the anterior capsular edge which you can probably just make out i'm filling that bag as we call it with viscoelastic to make sure it's ready for the new lens and then I'm going to put the new lens in, so I'm just going to make the incision fractionally bigger, up to about three millimetres in size, just so that I can actually insert the lens with ease. It doesn't always have to be the case. And then this new lens is, 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 is in the shape of a burrito. It's folded and it's in, in an introducer. And what I'm going to do is slot it in. It's got a circular optic in the middle, which is the focus bit, and it's got two arms that you can see unfolding as we speak. There's an arm at the top an arm at the bottom, these are called haptics, and these arms will unfold gracefully 
and you've got to guide them into the capsular bag and they hold the lens in place. And the patient is fully awake during this entire procedure, apart from the children I operate on, and I'll do those under general. And that patient will be experiencing a complete psychedelic kaleidoscope of, of basically like they've taken drugs um, at this point, and they'll be quite remarkably impressed. They don't feel any pain during this operation. It's painless. We put a little bit of local in during the operation, but there's no big injection of local. And then we just remove the viscoelastic. Uh, and that is the operation. So I think I'll stop there, moving on. Good. Right, so the other nice thing about it, and this, this follows on from that, is gadgets, toys, gizmos. If you like new toys to play with, and that goes for anybody really, then this is your specialty. We get new toys to play with every single year, several. And uh, whether it's a new ultrasound machine, like the one you can see in the top there, we can do our own ultrasounds of the eye, looking at structures, making diagnoses, we've got in, uh, OCT optical scans of the eye giving three-dimensional cuts through the retina. This device over here you'll see is, a, is an indirect ophthalmoscope. I used that on um, the other day just to laser a retina of a prem baby. I'll show you what that's all about in a second. Uh, that's a probe taking the intraocular pressure top left. Uh, on the right, you can see an angiogram where we've injected dye, uh, um, fluorescein dye into the veins of the patient and then taken images of their retina looking at the flow of the blood uh, through the retina. Again, I'll show you some examples of that. Corneal topography, bottom left, measuring the surface curvature of the eye, a bit like a, a map, so that we can plan surgery accordingly. Uh, that's our slit lamp that can also be digitally um, recorded. And, and then you've got lasers. So for, uh, we, we, we laser people's eyes in different ways. We can laser the iris, we can laser the retina, we can use headsets or we can use direct lasers. And again, that's part of our day-to-day -day job. This is an example of a small baby that, uh, not exactly the same one, but one that I lasered the other day for retinopathy of prematurity. So we have a lens or we're focusing the laser and firing the laser through the lens in through the pupil, which is dilated and focusing it on the retina and making a small burn. This is what a normal retina looks like. And in retinopathy of prematurity, which is what this child had, they had developed an ischemic area of retina due to the fact that they'd been given so much oxygen to keep them alive. A, the blood supply stopped growing. It, you can see how the blood vessels coming from the optic nerve have terminated prematurely. Um, and you've got this ridge of proliferative material now. And, that, and the reason for that is the eye has gone to meltdown thinking it hasn't got enough blood supply to the peripheral ischemic retina later down the line, and it goes into overkill producing uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, and you get this um, uh, overgrowth of blood vessels that attach the retina and cause the poor little baby who's prem to go blind. So what we do is we inject anti-VEGF material into the eye and we lose do laser treatment. So this is the laser burns you can see in the superior retina up here, where we photocoagulated that ischemic damaged retina. And that one treatment will provide each eye with 100 years of life of sight, you know, we, that's a sight th um, preserving operation and it's one of the ones that we do in paediatric ophthalmology. So it's a, a very fulfilling and uh, fun uh, specialty to be in. This is a picture of a retina with very tortuous vessels, arterioles and venules, and these arteries and venue, uh, veins are very tortuous because this this, uh, this child has got a arteriovenous malformation, which when you do the angiography, you can see lit up and the blood flows straight from the arteries into the veins without going through into the capillaries and causes various ischemic events. And this is part of a syndrome called Wyburn-Mason syndrome. And again, it's one of thousands of syndromes and conditions that can present in the eye. The eye is an incredibly beautiful structure. You saw some nice images there, but on a daily basis, that's what you stare at as a specialty, whether it's the very surface. And if you look at this image on the right with an injected uh, sclera and episclera, if you use a slit lamp, you can actually dial right down and see the capillaries. And you can see red blood cells flowing through the capillaries. You know, we are very, very privileged in ophthalmology. We can see blood, we can see blood vessels, we can see blood cells, we can see nerves, we can see tissue inside, we can see part of your brain, the eye, the retina is your brain. So in doing so, we have this little open window into the, into the body where we can see all different various things going on that others cannot without invasive um, techniques. Uh, what you can see at the bottom right here is gonioscopy. We're using a special lens to look at the drainage angle between the uh, cornea and the iris, where the fluid drains out of the eye. 
um, and you can you can see in slit lamp microscopy on the bottom on the left there with the lens in cross section showing you a cataract um, it, that has developed. Top image there with uh, areas of red in the iris is a translumination of the iris. You're looking through the iris with a light and you're seeing in this patient light coming back reflecting and escaping through gaps in their iris because this patient's got translumination defects either due to conditions like albinism or some other conditions such as pseudo exfoliative uh, pseudo exfoliation where the, uh, the iris rubs off um, and you get a thinning of the iris that can predispose patients to glaucoma. So you know that's that's what we get to look at N nothing horrible and nasty in the body it's a very clean elegant specialty and then at 5 30 I go home I do not stay and I don't have to come in on call I don't think I've had to come in on call out of hours for years perhaps once I'm trying to remember um, and uh, you know, most of our work and surgery will be done during the day, even the emergencies, we tend to do it in a cool, calm collector. If somebody's had a penetrating trauma, we tend to do it at the next available slot. Um, sometimes we'll do it overnight if it's going to be too much of a delay. But again, that will tend to be in the early evening, not certainly not in the out of hours. So that means you get to have a life. You can do, I, I play music, I play sport, um, um, and I have three kids, and I get to do everything I want to do outside of the world, and then enjoy my job for the, for the, uh, for the hours that I'm there. But when I'm at work, I'm working very intensively. Compared to a lot of specialties, we see a lot of patients, our clinics are jam-packed, not in COVID, but jam-packed normally with patients, and our theatres are jam-packed with cases. Uh, it's high turnover. So you are kept busy, and you are very effective, but when you switch off, you can be very relaxed. Again, another advantage of ophthalmology. No, you do not have to put your finger anywhere you do not want to. There's no PRs, there's no, no, um, catheters i even had to think of what, what a catheter was there because i'd forgotten no catheters to put in that you don't have to go anywhere underneath the neck uh, there's no blood splattering all over you uh, it's very clean very elegant specialty so you can relax it's a, it's just a perfect job the training is pure eye surgery so once you finish your foundation year, you do seven years of ophthalmology and those seven years are really um under our tuition will take you from the very beginning to the end. And at the end of seven years, if you're not an effective eye surgeon by that end, well, there's something wrong with you because you, know, you really, really will have so much experience. Most of our uh, ST7 trainees will have over a thousand operations at least under their belt before they become a consultant, which if you compare to any, almost any other specialty is unheard of. Um, and our surgeons are very comfortable teaching and training the next generation as well. Um, when you come on board, um, uh, as I'm interviewing on Friday, 600 people, I think it is, for something like ACST1 jobs. So it's quite a competitive specialty to get into. Um, but once you're in, and once you've got that golden ticket, um, you know, it's a run through. So you don't get thrown off uh, halfway through. Uh, there's no re, re application. There are some exams. You do a part one exam after by the end of by the end of year two, but preferably you can do it even before you start the program. Uh, there's a there's a refraction exam that you do by the end of year three, and then there's a final fellowship exam that you do before the end, but you usually do in year five. So um, we'll prepare you for that, and then you're you're off and running. And then in the last year or two, you start to subspecialize in the area that you're particularly interested in. That's called training selected components. You could take a break somewhere between, let's say, year three and year four, or, or later or earlier, to do a research MD or PhD. I'll show you some of the research opportunities that come up in ophthalmology, because it's fantastic from that perspective, very academic, if you want it to be, but not if you don't. You can also do medical ophthalmology and not be a surgeon whatsoever, but those that's a very different career pathway. You tend to come at it from, generally speaking, you come at it having done medicine as a SHO, as a junior, um, call, uh, you know, the, the IMT, and then you can do ophthalmology, a bolt on after that um, and come and join our program. Um, you're actually under the College of Physicians. Um, we are developing more subspecialization career opportunities and non-operating opportunities within ophthalmology going forwards. So there's a new curriculum starting in 2023. So even if you came into ophthalmology and decided surgery wasn't for you, there, there are definitely options that are non-surgical, for example, oncology or medical ophthalmology or medical retina. Um, um, so they're neuro-ophthalmology. So there are various things that you can do. 
It's also an, uh, very popular with less than full-time trainees. Um, it's got very um, sim uh, similar uh, gender split. So I think actually we've got more females than we've got males by quite a lot compared to most surgical specialties. I think it's the most female oriented specialty, maybe obs and gynae is now as well, but certainly ophthalmology is. Because partly because let's face it, we want to have a life outside of, of medicine um, as well as having uh, a good career. This is the simulator that will plonk you on before you start. You can actually practice as a medical student, go and uh, have a go. Uh, there are several scattered around the country. We have four, uh, three at the moment, soon to be four in the east of England, where I, I work. Um, and these are state-of-the-art virtual simulators that you can practice your surgery on. And we get you to do various modules before you actually start on real patients. Uh, and we talk you through the operations stepwise. This is fantastic fun and good fun for even us. You can do almost any operation you like. So ophthalmology, as I said, has lots of different specialties. There's cornea. Uh, that's an example of a corneal graft. You can see what here is a full thickness graft that's been removed. A new graft donor has been put in and stitched in place. This technology has moved hugely in the last 10 years. Now you're doing partial thickness grafts, endothelial grafts, all kinds of techniques which don't involve a full thickness graft all the time. Um, so it's a really good surgical specialty, I would say. Uh, I do paediatric ophthalmology, which is kind of nice because it works with kids, it's fun, the clinics are uplifting, very varied, so you have everything from syndromes, genetics, development, retinopathy of prematurity, you have a lot of the um, systemic conditions that present in the eye, you have the retinal problems, you have glaucoma, you have corneal problems, so it, it keeps a breadth of ophthalmology that some of the other sub subspecialties have, have, have given up. Uh, there's neuro-ophthalmology, which again, in paediatrics, we do a lot of, but neuro-ophthalmology in the adult sphere, you can focus on, this is actually a child with a leukemic infiltration, unfortunately, of the optic nerve and retina that required urgent chemo and radiotherapy. Um, but neuro-ophthalmology is a diagnostic, it's a very fast, I mean, I love neuro, I did six months of neuro before I went into ophthalmology, and I love that, that kind of element of detective work, but I found neurology, um, bless them, slightly stunted in terms of what they could actually achieve, whereas in ophthalmology you can do all those fun diagnoses, and then you can do stuff about them. Vitreo retinal, very popular surgical specialty, and they're probably the only ones that do come out at night sometimes, but again, even most of them do it during the day. This is a retinal detachment. You can see where the arrow is marking out uh, a little um, uh, retinal tear. And one of your jobs as a junior eye surgeon will be to see examine patients who might have flashes and floaters, find a little tear in their retina before they can detach and do a little bit of laser therapy or cryotherapy to that area to seal it with, and stop it from detaching. That's very um, pleasing to do. Ocular plastics, and this involves tissues around the eye or the orbit. Um, tumor work, for example, there's a, I think it's a basal cell carcinoma where you've got a pentagon excision and then this flap is called a tensile flap being rotated round to fill the defects. So it's quite artistic, quite surgical specialty. Glaucoma, which is a um, very common condition, damaging progressive optic neuropathy due to or associated with high intraocular pressure. And you can see on the right, the optic nerve is cupped compared to that small white cup in the left image, the right white, large white cup due to damage of the neuro, neuroretinal rim and using medication or surgery to, to release the intraocular pressure, you can um, control the pressure and, and reduce the progression of the condition. Medical retina, dealing with conditions that affect the retina on a not surgical. Uh, in this case, you've got, for example, um, age-related macular degeneration for which injection of anti-VEGF drugs has revolutionized therapy over the last 20 years. Um, you've also got diabetic retinopathy um, and the management of that, as well as various other interesting conditions like vasculitis and hypertension and, and immunological conditions that can present, as well as um, hematological conditions in the retina. And then you've got ocular oncology, um, where you've got tumours that can present an eye. This is a child with a retinoblastoma, uh, and the management of that is extremely specialised. So it's a, it's a, there's a bit for everyone, really. Uh, none of those specialties are similar, and if you're not a particularly surgical one, um, you can go into an area that doesn't require so much surgery. If you prefer to work with kids, you can work with kids. If you prefer to do innovative surgery, you can do innovative surgery. If you're artistic, you can become an artistic surgeon, an ocular plastic surgeon. You know, if you're like a detective and you like neuro, you can do neuroophthalmology, or you can do a mixture of two or three different things. I do paediatric and neuroophthalmology, um, but because it's peds, I do a bit of everything. Moving on, 
um, ophthalmology gears itself very nicely to overseas work. And I mean, I don't, you know, I, it, it's, it's the sort of thing that I always think is that it's quite a personal subject. You do what you want to do. Um, and and I, I, as it happens, I've been quite involved in projects because I've enjoyed them. And it, it's a two-way process. Whilst it's altruistic and you're, and you're doing something to help others, you get a lot of benefit from it because you learn how to achieve different goals in different ways. Um, you learn from amazing colleagues around the world who probably do um, even more challenging work than you do because they haven't necessarily got the kit. Uh, this is me operating in uh, Kenya. I did a pediatric um, symposium there for a week um, where we had um, pediatric ophthalmologists from lots of different countries all turning up in Kenya and then I took them through surgery both on simulation surgery and then in real life um, to teach them the core skills of pediatric ophthalmology which is not something that they'd come had a lot of exposure to so that was that was a real um, privilege to have done I thoroughly enjoyed that in fact I took, took my medical student do daughter with me on that trip she had an absolute um, whale of a time. This is another trip I did um, to rural China. This is a child with pediatric cataracts. You can see they've sat with these cataracts for almost six or seven years, not being able to see. Um, and they were out in a, in a very small village and they were, because we were visiting, they were all sort of collected up and brought to the center. Now, what I don't do is go in there and try and be a hero at all. That's not, that's not my game at all. The, the main thing about going abroad and doing work is to try and help develop skill sets that we are so privileged to have a seven year program in the UK. Fine, we've got loads of training just to share that. And, 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 and that's a two way process. We learn from it, but to share those experiences with colleagues who perhaps in this case had never done a pediatric cataract. So what I did was, oh, and the mum also had cataracts. So she was also sitting there, uh, they were getting fed and, and uh, looked after. And of course, if you think about it out in, in the third world, if you've got somebody who's blind, that's taking a second person out to look after that person as well. They can't have a functional um, life doing other things because you need a carer, a full-time carer. So reversal of blindness in the third world is an incredibly um, important uh, goal. And, um, and teaching surgeons to do it themselves, who are very talented surgeons, but maybe not experienced at it, is better. So this is me looking down an iPhone attachment, teaching this young surgeon who's fantastically um, um, nimble with his fingers to do the cataract on that kid and lo and behold he can suddenly see transformed life transformed world so uh, you know hugely violent. and that surgeon was so happy at the end of that because he just felt the confidence to be able to go on and do that um, in the future and you can keep in contact with these people and and, and now on, on online you can sort of support them with learning um, but um, and they can present difficult cases to you uh, virtually which is always useful um, another major aspect of ophthalmology is how impressively academic it can be if you want it to be now research and i do research trials but my research trials are mostly immunological and i'll come to that in a bit but the ones that um, are probably the most exciting i think are gene therapies and stem cell therapies that are coming online and i've got kids who are now having gene therapies for their retinal dystrophies due to genetic defect. And we have lots of genetic conditions that can present in the eye, hundreds and hundreds of them. And by injecting genes that have been attached into plasmids and then inject them under the uh, retina, you can actually um, cause that gene to be expressed again within the eye. And of course, you've got this in vivo ability to see what's going on. You can do the staining, you can actually visualize with confocal microscopy, with with uh, optical coherence tomography, you can actually visualize what's happening in real life without having to dissect all it out and, and, and in labs. So it's an amazing model for these up and coming new specialties of genetics. Um, and so I think it's the first gene therapy trials were in the eye. Um, and you're gonna find that ophthalmology is at the leading at front of a lot of these things because of the amount of money that's circulating around it and the tech that goes around with it. Artificial retinas, um, and lots of new medications, as I say, I, I deal with ones for kids, immuno anti, um, uh, sort of uh, immunosuppressants, uh, if you like, for kids with uh, immune related diseases that present in the eye. And that takes me on to, to the kind of conditions that um, I, I alluded to this earlier on. The eye is like a little window into your soul. You can see bits of the body that nobody else can see. My colleagues in pediatrics paediatricians let's say are always constantly sending me patients every week 
to have a look at to help them with the diagnosis, uh, whether it's diagnosing genetic disorders or syndromes or immune related problems or, or um, other endocrine conditions, neurological conditions, it's a huge amounts. You name the organ and we will have eye associations with it. There'll be syndromes, conditions that link, ability to diagnose from looking at the eye. I'll give you some examples. This is a child with uveitis. They've got little flecks of inflammation that have deposited on the inside of the cornea. And, and they're also scattered around the eye. And this is called iritis or uveitis. And in many kids and adults, it's associated with underlying immunological conditions, such as juvenile idiopathic arthritis, or sarcoidosis, or Bechet's disease, or HLA B27 spondyloarthropathies, um, or um, it can be associated with tumours and cancer. So it's lots of different things that you can get. Um, and we can, using our little na our various investigations on these sort of in individuals, make the diagnosis. And then using an MDT, a multidisciplinary team, and I work with the immunologists, so, so with the rheumatologists who are used to using a lot of these medications for immunological conditions. I work with them to immunosuppress children and help control their disease and stop them going blind. And, and we're working on various trials. We've done some national trials and now we're working collaboratively with San Francisco. So you get flown out to San Francisco meetings and, and, and it's very fun to be involved in these trials. The other conditions that we look at, a lot of them are neurological, um, particularly in peds. So this is a, a child who was four years old, started bumping into things out of the blue and hey, um, looking in the back of their eyes, you can see this bilateral papilledema. Um, which is a swelling of the optic nerve, secondary to raising intracranial pressure, and they've got a craniopharyngioma, which can be excised and the child can survive. So, you know, again, very important ability to diagnose these conditions early on and make a difference. This is a patient sent to me for, with cafe a lay spot. Uh, like looking in their eye, we can see little nodules on their eyes called, called iris called Lish nodules, and that can diagnose neurofibromatosis type 1. That can be associated with optic nerve gliomas, which you can see in the image here, swelling of the optic nerve in this case, and a swelling of the optic nerve behind the orbit on that right, present, presented to us in the eye department and required urgent radiotherapy that again, preserved their vision. Um, this is another child with a ptosis of the left upper lid and a smaller pupil on this side and a slightly different color iris. This is known as Horner syndrome. And in a child can be associated with a whole variety of different things. We'll investigate them thoroughly. And in this particular child, uh, had a thoracic neuroblastoma. So again, incredibly important diagnostic ability that can lead on to uh, intervention and uh, either sight or life preserving therapy. This is a child who's got um, an eye movement disorder where if you watch them, they throw their head across rather than move their eyes and their eyes follow. And this is just one example of many different types of ocular motor problems that we deal with. And this is called ocular motor apraxia. And when you see that, you can then again diagnose various conditions. For example, in this particular child had cerebellar vermis aplasia associated with Joubert syndrome, which is a, um, a complex genetic, genetic disorder that affects the retina and the brain and leads to um, this sort of ocular motor apraxia early in life and then visual problems more later in life. I guess any talk about ophthalmology, even though I don't particularly do this, um, in fact, I don't do it, um, it, you can make a lot of money. So you know, I just, just to put it out there, for those who like to make a lot of money and feel that you've worked very hard to get your medical degree and you ought to be able to earn a lot at the same time, whilst also contributing to society, whilst also being able to go and play uh, sport and music and spend time with your family, then you can go and do private surgery as well in your spare time, cataracts, or you can do laser eye surgery. And you can be, I think it's probably the, the highest earning specialty of all because the operation like the cataract operation I can do in seven minutes and you're, you're going to earn quite a few hundred pounds for every one of those. And I've got colleagues who'll just spend the morning doing 12 to 14 of those and then they carry on with their job and they've earned quite a nice second, third income doing that. So it is a great specialty from a, from a, from a financial perspective, if that's what that floats your boat. And ironically, even though we don't save a lot of lives, we save a lot of lives because uh, indirectly. We don't do it directly, but indirectly. Like I've given you some examples of conditions that we can diagnose, but also we can prove their vision 
and uh, avoid people driving around, especially uh, in the east of England, where lots of people drive out in the uh, in the in the um, out on the broads um, in their cars, not being able to see very well, causing accidents and hurting people. So we do actually save quite a lot of lives indirectly by improving people's eyesight. So hopefully that talk has given you some insight into a career that I have been privileged to have enjoyed for now. I think I've been doing ophthalmology since I started uh, as an SH, SHO, it's 20 years. Um, and I'm still got the energy and enthusiasm and passion for it that I always had. Um, it's kept me young, it's kept me enthusiastic. During COVID, it's been a bit of a stretch because a lot of our work has been put on hold. Uh, we've only done more urgent stuff, but we have been put to use because we're no use on wards. They don't shove us in the in the in the um, on the COVID wards particularly. Well, I tend to get put in the vaccination hub uh, because I can do quick procedures rapidly with good hand-eye coordination. So I'm very I'm very quick at the vaccinations. Um, but but in general, ophthalmology as a career has a future. You're always going to need ophthalmologists that patients are always going to have the cataracts, always going to have other operations doing it. Hospitals will always need them. The private sector will always need them. And the way it's evolving, there's going to be a career uh, expansion in ophthalmology going forward. So I would strongly recommend it. And at that point, I will close my talk and open up the floor to any questions that you might have. Um, hopefully somebody's looked at the chat and, and knows. Thank you very much. I think that's what you wanted. Yeah, no, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I just think that was really interesting and just so brilliant to get such a, a, a fabulous broad insight into a specialty that is so exciting and just you don't get as much experience in medical school. So really no. appreciate your time. Thank you. You don't, you don't. I was, I, have... I, I was third generation, so I used to watch eye videos when I was growing up and they kind of imprinted on my head. So I kind of had lots of experience going into it. I have a feeling if I did that in my house, my mum would freak, but <laughs> we do have some questions, actually. Yes. Um, so I'm just having a little look. Well, yeah, that's will... a good question about AI. I can't yeah, I will start at the top for you. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, the question just for people who aren't looking at the Q&A is, what are your opinions on using AI to better diagnose conditions from retinal scans? And it seems that AI is outperforming human clinicians. Do you think this is worrying? Yeah, no, so it's not worrying, is it? Because if anything that we're going to do that's better for patients, we're happy with. And remember, you're always going to need us lot as experts to interpret the AI. So we're no, no, you're not, you're not going to get, unlike certain specialties, and I would say, for example, like radiology, if you're not in interventional radiology, radiology as a specialty, um, and maybe histology and pathology, I think you would be a bit worried, if I'm honest. Um, and, I, and I say this because I, I, as Associate Dean, I have been involved in AI work and, and done a lot behind it, the scenes about it regionally. And AI is going to be great for diagnosing things a bit earlier. It's picking up diabetic retinopathy, looking for glaucomatous changes early, um, diagnosing um, yeah, retinal problems in particular. And you could and you'll probably get information from retinal scans that you didn't even realize you could get. Um, based on that. But you're not going to replace the need for us as consultants to do the operations or to make the final diagnosis or to decide how you're going to manage that patient. Um, AI will enhance our ability, but it will, won't replace us particularly. Uh, in fact, it won't. Uh, you might find that you don't need quite as many, maybe medical retina specialists, maybe. But even that, I think, is still a safe option because of how much the work is expanding in that area. Fabulous. Um, so we've had another question. You were talking a bit about medical ophthalmology um, and sort of the career opportunities there. Could you tell us a little bit more for someone who isn't surgically yeah. minded? Yeah, so you've got two like? options if you're not surgically minded. Um, what I would pre preface this is with this is you don't have to be. So ophthalmology is a career for physicians and surgeons. In fact, when I play football for the consultant football team, we have an annual medics against surgeons and they keep moving me from one team to the other because they keep saying that I'm not really one or the other. And the point is that we're not surgeons in the full whack. You know, we're not doing open surgery and you don't have to have all of that going on. This is much more procedural. Now, there are a lot of medical specialties that are procedural, for example, cardiology or interventional radiology. And it's a bit more like that because you're doing stuff under microscopes, you're doing stuff interventionally. So you don't have to be um, a surgeon surgeon. 
But if you decide I'm not particularly keen on surgery, medical ophthalmology is something you can do medicine first, do your IMT, um, which is your medical sort of junior training, and then you can convert and apply for a medical ophthalmology number and you come across. Now the conditions you'll be work, you'll be mainly managing will be the various immunological conditions like the uveitis, uve, uveitis and, and retinitis and and um, you'll be dealing with patients who've got thyroid eye disease and um, maybe some of the tumors around the eye. You might be dealing with, you might deal with um, patients who've got, um, what else? Um, diabetic retinopathy and other medical retina type problems. Um, and so you'll, you'll, you'll use your medical ophthalmology, your medicine expertise in, in immunology and, and endocrine and, and stuff to supplement your, your ability. But you can do it through the other way. So you can become an ophthalmologist and particularly with a new curriculum that's coming, you don't have to be a surgeon surgeon. So you might be taught a bit of surgery and taught how to do it, but we're not gonna expect you to be God's gift and you could specialize and subspecialize at the end in a career that doesn't involve surgery in the new curriculum that's starting next year. So, or two years time. Fabulous. And while we're just sort of on the topic of training pathways and specialties, I've got a couple more questions just come in. So yeah. on the same sort of vein, can you do purely surgical ophthalmology if you wanted to? Yeah, yeah. Well, things like vitreoretinal or corneal are far more surgical. So our, our day to day job is theatre clinics. And then I do, I do ward rounds on the special care baby unit, um, but nobody else does ward rounds right so we don't do wards particularly um, and so that's nice because they smell but the the but but in terms of surgery um you can just you some specialties like vitreo retinal will have much more surgical sessions and less clinics um ocular plastics similarly and cornea so the nice thing here is you can find the thing that suits you and you can do that um and you don't have to be particularly surgical at the end of it uh, if you don't want to or you can be what other questions and we've got another one just on the subspecialties. At what point sort of in the pathway would you start to choose and start to subspecialize? First two years are general, and then you start to do six month blocks in each subspecialty. And once you've done, you usually do about five or six subspecialties, which are ticked off on your curriculum. And then in the last year and a half, you will start to subspecialize in the, and do a double, a second um, kind of sort of version of and the new cct in the new curriculum you'll actually come out at the end as a consultant with a subspecialty um cct in the, in the gmc so which you don't at the moment you just come out with a general ophthalmology could thing and, and a lot of our trainees will any anyway want to go and do a fellowship like i went to vancouver and did a fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology which is fun you know you go out there and learn all these techniques and you come back to the uk with all these new get, um, abilities that you know didn't have before so it's nice to go abroad and, and, and experience different things Okay. Um, and then we've got quite a few questions talking about portfolios and from a medical student perspective. Yes. What would be really, I think sort of the general yeah. thing, what would be your top? Well, I've been marking them. Uh, last week I marked loads of portfolios for the um, ST1s. And so I have a lot of insight into that. Um, and basically what you want to show is an interest in, uh, in ophthalmology. So your, your commitment to ophthalmology will be marked on things like, I think somebody asked about IC simulators and how you can access them. Most the units that have got them, you can identify, uh, for example, uh, in the East of England, uh, Cambridge has got one, James, James Paget, Great Yarmouth have got one and uh, Luton and Dunstable have got one, but we're about to have one in Norwich as well. Um, and so you can just find the college tutor for ophthalmology in that, in, that, in that unit and ask them and they will point you in the right direction. And you can basically go and do some modules and you can get marks, you can get the certificate for the modules. And that's one of your guaranteed marks on your portfolio. Uh, doing a taster week gets you a mark, doing an elective gets you a mark or a project. Uh, any papers or case reports will get you marks. Um, you don't have to have a, a research paper, you, you'll get marks generically for any research you've done, even if it's renal, in the ophthalmology research section, uh, sorry, in the research section of your portfolio marks, but you'll get additional marks if you've done a case report in ophthalmology. So, you know, your renal MD or intercalated degree might be still a lot of marks for you, and that's always useful to have, but then showing a commitment to ophthalmology is, is always good. So doing a taste a week, um, showing that you've been to, I think it's 20 clinics or something like that, um, and getting them signed off. You need to get them all documented and signed off by your consultants to show that you've been. Um, 
and it helps you with answering some of the questions and the communication skills and, and, and uh, I think this year because it's all virtual we're, we've cut out the clinical um, um, what do you call it um, uh, station but there is a clinical station normally with an image like for example of a diabetic retinopathy or a optic nerve swelling so really common things that you'd expect even a GP or a or a physician to be able to identify and maybe make some sensible diagnoses as to what the conditions are. Um, so look for common conditions. Uh, what else? Uh, th those are the main things. Yeah, no, I think that that gives Others. me two really good tips, to be honest. I think- bad, that... some, Somebody's asked, what are the bad aspects of the job? I've said the bad aspects. It's a difficult word to spell. You get mistaken for an optician and you get asked about laser eye surgery. You're there too is... enthusiastic about your job. That's the problem. I know. <laughs> so I, I think maybe if you do, so, I mean, there is, a, there, is some, there is some suggestion that if you end up being, let's say, just a cataract surgeon, most of us do cataracts as part of our job. So I'll do one or two lists of cataracts a week and then I'll do the rest of my job but if you were just doing cataracts all day every day because you were working in the independent sector maybe that would become too samey um, and too similar um, but otherwise you see there's enough variety on the complex end and what you need in a job is you don't want too much variety you know everybody goes oh I love variety I like A&E because it's got so much variety medical students love A&E because there's so much variety honestly it kills you after a bit because you will die from from exhaustion and mental uh, burnout what you need is a job that has a certain amount of secure stuff that you can do day in day out but enjoy that is actually relaxing and then you need a little bit that's stimulating and, and makes your brain tick, tick over. And that combination is incredibly important. If you choose a specialty that's either one or the other and not both, you're doomed for the reasons that are obvious. So I would say that ophthalmology, you just need to make sure you choose the area that you're most interested in and not the one, don't follow the money, don't follow the career, don't say, oh, there's lots of jobs coming out in that area, I'll become a plastic surgeon, ocular plastic surgeon. No, follow what you enjoy, and by definition, you'll, you'll, you'll have the enthusiasm to pull it off. Well, why did you choose ophthalmology over other subspecialties? So I think ophthalmology allows you to have that more discreet window into medicine. Neuro, for example, there's not as much interventional stuff. It's very interesting cerebrally. So I, I love my neuro and I use my neuro a lot. I, a lot of diagnoses neurologically, but I don't have to then, I, I'm not stopped from intervening. Uh, you know, I get a lot of patient satisfaction from interventions that you, do, you don't get at the neuro. I run a neuro ophthalmology forum with the neuro radiologists and the neurologists and the neuro ophthalmologists and the trainees all come to it in the east of England and that's really useful because you can learn from what how different things present to different ones of us. Bit boring question but do, bit boring is that me or is it a bit boring question? A bit boring question I think probably. I think it's a reference. <laughs> <laughs> We're just gonna go with that. But do you know how many portfolio points candidates who get through to interviews tend to have? Oh good question. Uh, no I don't know. But I would, having marked a bunch of them, I think you're looking at wanting to get over, I think it's out, I think it was out, of, was it out of 40? Or was it out of 50? Oh, I'm, so, I'm really sorry. It does tell you all this stuff on the website, the seven deanery do our national recovery. I think you need to have, you know, two thirds or above to be looking at getting, doing well. But there is a, there is a kind of generic uh, exam that you all do online that, sorts you out first and then I think everyone who passes that gets given an interview so you can you will get um, interviewed as long as you have that particular score is doing an FY rotation ophthalmology mandatory favorable no it's not mandatory or favorable in fact they make make a, a, a particular thing of not allowing extra marks for just doing an FY job so if you've done an FY job you have to go the extra mile to show that you've then done some extra clinics you've done some elective or you've done a project, you know, you mustn't just say, I've done an FY job. That doesn't get you any points. Uh, would you advise doing part one before entering ST1? No, I would say getting an ST1 number is that I did. I did do the F part one before getting a, a, an ST1, but that was before the, the whole new system of, of it being run through. Because it's competitive, get the number first, then do the exam, because it's quite a big commitment. Oh, you also get marks for doing the Duke Elder Medical Student Prize. Uh, only if you get in a certain percentage, I think it's, it's, it's clear on the website, but you, you have to come in the top so many to get some points for that. Yeah, I believe it's top 10% gives you two yeah, points, like top 60% gives you one point. Yeah, that's right. 
Uh, would starting SD1 at 40 years of age be a significant setback? Well, no, no, it's not because all the careers that you've got out there, if you're 40 and you've come out of medical school um, or, uh, or you're maybe, uh, maybe that person who, who's just asked that question is actually a disenfranchised orthopedic surgeon who wants to reclassify as an ophthalmologist, maybe that wouldn't be a good option. But if you're a medical student coming out and you've got a career ahead of you, however many years that may be, and remember we'll be worked to our grave, to, you know, we're not gonna retire at 60 anymore. So you've got minimum, even if you start at 40, you've got a minimum of 20, probably 30 years in your specialty. And the nice thing about ophthalmology is it's a fun run. It's not something that you'll have painful episode, you know, painful training and, you know, exhausting training to the point where you can't cope. And then you have a job at the end that's quite nice. Actually, it's an enjoyable job. The trainees have a lovely time. Even when they moan, I point out to them what their medical and surgical colleagues have to deal with on a daily basis. And then they realize that they're really lucky and they stop moaning. Because actually, you know, medical uh, ophthalmology trainees have got the gold, uh, they've got Willy Wonka's golden ticket to the, to the chocolate battery. And they don't have anything difficult to deal with, really. Um, student FYs who don't have access to IC course, could they be disadvantaged? It's not an IC course as such. There's an IC machine scattered around. Now, every region has got them. So you can't not have them. So it's not, you'll, you, you can't be not um, able to access them um, because they exist everywhere. And if nothing else, the Royal College have got them in London. So you can definitely get them. COVID's obviously been an issue, but I don't think that will affect you guys so much um, by the time you're actually coming to apply. The Duke Elder is tomorrow. Any tips? <laughs> um, good luck. Um, no, it's very. It's a very factual. I, I didn't actually do the Duke Elder because I didn't really realise it was it existed when I was a medical student. Um, and I, as I say, as a medical student, I didn't want to do ophthalmology. I wanted to carve my own career um, somewhere else. So I didn't do it. But I think it's. A, we did do some lectures for the students. Um, is it mostly multiple choice, right? And I think the important thing with that is there's always one stupid answer. There's always one that you know is not the right answer, and then it comes down to two, and then you back yourself. Is it? I can't remember if it's negative marking. There isn't any negative marking. No, so, so answer every question. Yeah, just and give everything a go. Having everything. done a few courses for this, my advice for anyone, I mean, tomorrow is a bit soon, so I'm really sorry, my friend. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but for anyone who hasn't actually, um, or who's thinking of doing it next year, I can thoroughly recommend the Moorfield Study Day. So I did that this year. It's really, really good. That's a really good one to go to. And it's, it's yeah. not, there's a lot of things that are quite expensive. That's not, so that would be my personal one to whoever is interested. Yeah, yeah, but good luck, good luck. Uh, but yeah, so this is And when time. and how really can you start cool. getting involved in global humanitarian efforts? Well, it's up to you and the amount you do and the variety that you do is entirely your, your call. Um, mostly you would want to have a few skill sets before you embark on it. Um, but we are encouraging trainees to think about doing it. So there's the we're looking at doing global, um, introducing in the east of England a global fellow, uh, where you can get three years out and do a tropical school of medicine course, go abroad for a bit on a project, come back. So there is that option. You could go, you could go out of program and do it. But in general, you will feel probably the most useful doing it once you've actually got all your skill sets and you're qualified because when you then go you're an expert so when i go to china rural china uh, or i go to africa um you get treated really nicely because you're a, you're an expert but also you are more comfortable operating and dealing with complex stuff that you could come across for the first time out there whereas if you're a medical student i think or not a medical uh, medical student maybe you can certainly go on project as medical students you know i would encourage that you can certainly go abroad during your holidays um People have done that, lots of people have done that and, and do elective. But to be useful, I think you need to have done the job and maybe been trained fully. This is not a question, but this talk has really inspired me to work towards a career in ophthalmology. Thank you. Pleasure. Which I think is quite a nice place to That's end. I'm all about. Because that's Yeah, no, it's good. And I, look, I, hope, I hope you guys really do understand. There are lots of lovely careers out there um, that are a close second. Um, to ophthalmology but um, I hope I've shown you that it's a it's one that you can be passionate about and enjoy it has a bit for everybody and you genuinely um, genuinely will be a happy person practicing it um, and because you've got happy patients and I would say that but you've got the research you've got the overseas work you've got the private sector you've got um, academic you've got um, 
everything you can think of and it and it and a career work life balance and i would welcome you in the east of england if you guys apply east of england is a vast area geographically but what i've done is divided it up into four sections so you would be more geographically located in one of those four zones and not have to commute so far because they don't want you driving around tired um so that is that is me done i hope that's been fun I that was that. brilliant thank you so much for for your time and and as people have said a really inspiring talk um just to remind everyone there is a feedback form that's been shared in the chat if you do have the time to fill that out we would be very grateful um and it's just a sign of appreciation really for mr pavana chandra's time so um, yeah it'd be lovely and then i hope you have a lovely webinar series and that every talk you have is hopefully inspiring a group of people into that especially but do ask them the question if they have their time again would they become an ophthalmologist because i think you'll probably find they would brilliant no, fantastic well thank you so much and everyone thank you very much everyone a lovely evening